Welcome back. This is part two of vision, which let's flip back to the beginning here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. At the beginning here, we're looking at unit two, sensation and perception vision. And we have flipped through here in the first part and looked at um, the fact that we use light to see. We talked about rainbows and how that all works and, and functions. It's a good example of wavelength and what we're seeing and what kind of color or hue that we perceive from light looked at the different um, lengths of wavelengths and the the frequency which helps to de de deliver the color to us the intensity then is determined by the height of the wave and the higher the wave the more intense we looked at the dark side of the rainbow and um, the dark side of the snow moon we also looked at saturation, the difference in the purity of light waves. We would not be able to perceive differences in saturation if we were not able to see the differences in purity of light waves. Talk to transduction, which is sort of where the magic happens, right? Transduction is where we convert this light energy and vision into a way to transfer it through the neurons electrically. There's the structure of the eye. We looked at all the different port parts of it and they're important because we want to make sure we can understand how vision is happening in the eye. Nearsightedness, farsightedness, and unfortunately bifocalness. And we looked at the strength of the eye, blind spots and blind sight. We did the blind spot experiment, looked at the fovea, the retina, cones and rods, and ganglion and bipolar cells. Now. What we need to look at here next is this idea of feature detection. As we said initially here, we're bringing in the senses, but then the brain is working with um, prior knowledge, um, information, and some of this is believed to be hardwired in the human condition, in the human brain, to be able to make sense of the world and so there are cells and neurons in the brain that are in the visual cortex that respond selectively to specific features of complex stimuli things like edges and you see the edges here edges of their faces angles lengths and movements where you can see someone's form from across the room you don't even see their face but you see how they're moving and you know who that is. And like President Bush used to do this kind of thing. <laughs> like that kind of thing. Like he'd just kind of hunch over and do that. And Obama does his thing where he's um, sometimes doing the head nod. Presidential politics, Saturday Night Live gets a hold of it. And impersonators get a hold of these guys. And they usually do a quick caricature of them. To, But people laugh. They think it's funny because they see the feature detection that a very good impersonator can pull out and show you and even though a guy like Frank Caliendo who is uh, Miss Duez and I have seen him live before when he was first getting started he's, a, I mean, he's an amazing talent he's very good at impersonating voice and then mannerism of someone I mean he looks nothing like the people that he is portraying but he can pull it off pretty well and how he pulls it off is because he's very good at the edge, angle, length, movement and the voice inflection, tone and pacing of of what he does. So there's a good example of it here on Letterman. It's pre it's pretty pretty good uh, episode here. It's or a segment's about 10 minutes in length. I'm not going to play it here for you, but you can check it out in the notes. Um, we saw a little bit of this in class um, just recently, but the little dots that make up this ability to capture movement and the computer is going to take in um, this motion capture and a guy like um, Lincecum who is a Cy Young Award winner for the world champion in San Francisco Giants a few years ago he has a very distinctive wind up, a very distinctive method of pitching and you couldn't create a video game and just guess with that and really the only way the computer would be able to do it appropriately is to put the suit on him and have him go through his windup and, and, and produce it. I mean, maybe you could do something where you were capturing an image off the television or you've recorded him, but it wouldn't be probably as good. These little dots 
uh, give us the ability to really understand and see. And like when you're playing a video game, you feel like you're the character in some one of these sports games uh, because it looks so much like them. It's pretty amazing. Um, we also are seeing now some amazing things like feature detection with computers and technology. You've probably seen this on Facebook where they've asked you to identify someone or tag somebody in a photo and they already know who it is and they say okay this is David Duez are you going to approve that you're, these are your pictures or a picture of you that somebody else took but the computers are getting so good at being able to detect it. Now Google Glass is what, that's the Ser, Sergey um, Brini I think his name is, he's one of the um, CEOs of um, Google he's wearing what amounts to be a little computerized device you can look up into it and see it like a screen and uh, you know I wouldn't be surprised if at some point you have eyeglasses or a computer here that you're able to communicate with pretty effectively and they're using Google Glass a lot these days um, I always think it's interesting it's called Google Glass but there, there's no glass you know uh, we'll look more at it when we talk, I think it's consciousness down the road. But here's how your brain does it. Um, houses and chairs, faces, um, you get a, a sense, houses down here, you get a sense for like where the brain's going to light up and how it's going to look at these different things. But we're able to do color, motion, form, and depth all at the same time. And this a simultaneous processing of several aspects of a problem is what parallel processing is all about. And you get a good look at it here and how it works, that these are the eyes, and you see how it crosses there um, in the ciliary ganglion. And then it goes back to the back of the brain, and it kind of rewraps back around again. It, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, you see it, one is the blue line here. Retinal ganglion cells. It goes all the way to the back. Number two, this is the part where the midbrain and the... Um, uh, protectoral nucleus are making some sense of things. They're passing it number three back into the middle of the brain and then back out here. It's like a a continual um, pattern and another good way of seeing it is the right visual field here is purple. The left visual field is more of like a peach and in the middle it's something kind of combined. Well you can see how these things cross and in which direction that they go and then where they form these images in the brain and the uh, visual cortexes. So pretty amazing stuff here. Um, that we're able to even know that this is how it works is, is a cool thing. So color, motion, form, and depth are the four things that you're able to do that way. Another way of looking at it, and I don't know which one of these will help you. I think each one's looking at it sort of in a different way. The visual area of the thalamus is what that's focused on there. That's what this um, is in that spot and that's the op optic chasm it's almost like where it's uh, crossing over so eagle football uh, it's football season in the fall and how do we see color if we go to the football games it used to be we had all red uniforms it's a little easier to talk about this now we don't but if we were wearing all red or maybe you went to a volleyball game or a soccer game or something and the fans are wearing red and it's a red out and we're seeing the, the players in the field what colors are the eagles wearing in this? It looks pretty simple, but how do we see that color? The perception of color is a strange thing. The eagle uniform is anything but red. The uniform rejects the long wavelengths of light that to us are red. So red is reflected off and we see it. It's the light being reflected off. Also, light has no real color. It is our mind that perceives the color being there. And this seems like bull crap for a lot of people. Like there's no way that it's, it's just that color. It isn't. Your brain is creating it. And that's the best way for you to kind of to, to think through it. And the reason for that is, you know, you're going to see it in some of the tricks we'll do here with visual, um, visual tricks of the, of the brain. But let's look at two of the color theories and get your 64 Crayola colors there. Um, and you know how this works when you combine colors. Um, it makes sense, doesn't it? If you do like red and blue, you get purple. So there's magenta. Red and blue make magenta or purple. That makes sense, right? Well, that's not exactly how the, the brain does it. 
with a vision. So don't get too confused by that. Some people get really kind of confused. There's additive color and subtractive color. So red and blue make purple. That is subtractive color. That's what they call that. Additive color is more along the lines of you're getting color um, with, with light. So subtractive is paint and additive is light. Additive and subtractive color combinations are different. Um, if you take green and blue and you put those together when you're doing um, subtractive colors, green and blue is going to give you what? It's going to give you what's in the middle here. Um, kind of a, a, a darker color. If you do um, additive, what are you going to get? Red and blue kind of gives you that magenta. So you, you have to kind of be careful with this. This gets a little bit confusing and difficult to understand. But there are two different theories. There's a young Helmholtz trichromatic three color theory. And trichromatic is what we'll call it most of the time. According to this theory of color vision, there are three receptors in the retina that are responsible for the perception of color. One receptor is responsible for green, there's a blue, and a third is red. So trichromatic are your green, blue, and red. And you can kind of see that up here, green, blue, and red. Um, or maybe you can understand that that's additive, isn't it? Green, blue, and red. So <clears throat> three different types of receptor cells in our eyes, and together they can, be, they can pick any combination of our seven million color combinations. Most colorblind people simply lack cone receptor cells for one or more of the primary colors. And so they have difficulty then creating colors off of the combinations, according to this theory. So let's look at the principle of additive color mixing. At Showtime, the choir thing that uh, is so well done every year, choir uh, folks do a tremendous job with this show. If, if you're someone who's never gone to it, you should check it out. That's some really great stuff. But you may notice that whenever they're shining the red and the green spotlights and they overlap, they seem to change to the color yellow for the spotlight. And you can see it here at the top. Green and red form yellow and green and red here form yellow. That just seems uh, strange, like it shouldn't happen. If you put all three of these together, what are you going to get? A white color so very odd that's not not the kind of color combinations that you're used to with paint the subtractive colors right so keep that in mind opponent process theory is the second theory so we had the first one trichromatic analysis opponent process theory it states that we cannot see certain colors together in combination these are what's called agonist or antagonist sorry and or opponent colors so antagonist opponent colors white and black green and red and yellow and blue this is very confusing for some people so kind of stick with me here if you need to pause the video and write some things down as we go do that and and then we'll talk through it trichromatic makes clear some of the processes involved in how we see color. It does not explain all aspects of color vision, so that's a weakness here in the opponent process theory, or sorry, in the trichromatic theory. So trichromatics here, and they're saying, does it tell us, explain all aspects of color vision? It does not. Opponent process theory kind of steps in to help that. So this was developed by Ewald Ehring or herring and who noted that there are some color combinations that we never get to see we can never make sense of it a reddish green or yellowish blue it just doesn't seem to work they're opponent or antagonist to each other so opponent process theory suggests that color perception is controlled by the activity of two opponent systems a blue yellow mechanism and a green red mechanism so you can kind of see those laid out here for you on this screen. Like I said, you may want to pause this, rewind this, absolutely write this down. Every year in class that I've lectured over this, it's been a difficult thing for students to understand. So take your time on opponent process there. And we're going to talk about it in class as well. Here's another way of looking at it. 
Opposing retinal processes enable color vision. On, off. Red, green, blue, yellow, black, white. Red, green, yellow, blue, white, black. So an on and off. If you pair them together, and that's what they're saying here, the process theory was developed and said there are some combinations we never see. So if you've got red and green, it shuts the, that off. Another way of thinking about this is um, and putting this together is which theory is most accepted today is it trichromatic or opponent process theory most researchers agree that a combination of both both trichromatic and opponent process theory are needed to help explain color the individual cones appear to correspond best to the trichromatic theory while the opponent processes may occur at the other layers of the retina Okay, so that's helpful to see that there is a little bit of uh, disparity here in difference, but if you kind of combine both of the theories together, it makes some sense. We'll see this a lot in psychology. There will be like two major theories that when you put them together seem to help answer the, answer the problem. So the important thing to remember is that both concepts are needed to explain color vision in a full way. Let's look at color blindness and color issues with vision. People who suffer red-green blindness have trouble perceiving the number within the color design at the bottom or the boat at the top there. So they won't be able to see those things. It'll sort of see, seem to be like grayish or they will get the same colors that are surrounding it. So color defects are generally, or genetically, sorry, transmitted. This means that recent research has concluded that it's uh, conclusively mapped that this is the, the case. Um, monochromats which have no or only one type of functioning cone type is resp and respond to light as black and white film like a black and white television program or movie colors are, re are records only as gradients of intensity but likely to find daylight uncomfortable if not uh, function if no functioning cones those with one cone which is okay but still can't discriminate colors very small people are monochromats but it is possible dichromats are uh, folks that have one malfun mal malfunctioning cone system so depending on the type various colors will not be perceived inability to perceive blue is the rarest like in 1950 in England they went through the population and found only 17 people who had a uh, a problem with being able to see uh, with just one color. So let's look at some after image experiments and what I'm going to do with this is read through them pretty quickly but if you want to look at this yourself and pause it and just experience this some of these experiments would help you understand how the brain processes vision and color and why you know we're able to trick the uh, the brain because we're playing the processes against each other so let's check it out opposite opponent colors are never perceived together remember that's the opponent process theory so you can create your own demonstration for these opponent systems by observing the effect of what's called after images and you probably have seen this kind of thing before so you will look at the center of the X on the next screen for about 30 seconds so to do that you're gonna to need to pause the video because I'm not gonna wait for 30 seconds then immediately look at the next white slide you're going to blink a few times to then see the after image when you open up your eyes and you you stare at the screen. So let's try it. There's the X. Pause the video, 30 seconds, and then we'll flip it forward. Okay. Flipping it forward here, blink about 10 times or so, and then look directly at the center of the screen, the white screen, and do you see the after image? What does it look like? So an after image can retain the colors of the original stimulus, which is a positive after image, or the colors might be in reverse to the after image, like a photographic negative. We're going to see that in a second. The conditions favoring the production of after images are either brief exposures to intense, very bright stimuli, or other dark conditions, like a quick glance at the setting sun. We've all done that, and then you've seen spots, right? or prolonged exposure to colored stimuli in well-lighted conditions. So if you've had a, a fixating st uh, steadily on a colored object for like 60 seconds and then you avert the eyes to a gray or white background, you're going to see this 
problem where your eyes are so overstimulated it's having trouble adjusting back. So your brief stimuli, the first after image is usually positive, the same colors as the visual stimulus. And when only a single stimulus is presented, the positive after image is difficult to distinguish from the internal image or sensation. So that's why this is usually paired up, like the X had a green and red. Remember, opponent process theory says, is there a greenish red? There isn't. So you're not going to have any situation where that blends together. So you're going to de get a definite X because there's no greenish red that we're able to perceive and see uh, in the brain. Um, I just flipped that and saw the, saw the red X. So um, that's how that works. So after staring at the red blue shamrock, okay, we're going to get to the shamrock here in a second you saw a green and yellow after image. Opponent process theory proposes that you stared at the red blue shamrock you were using the red and blue portions of the opponent process uh, cells but after a period of 60 to 90 seconds of continuous staring you expended these cells capacity to fire action potentials. This is back to the neurons in the brain like we talked about um, in the first part of this unit. In a sense you temporarily wore it out and the red and blue portions of these cells. And then you looked at a blank white sheet of paper and under normal conditions, the white light would excite the opponent process cells. So recall that white light contains all the colors of light. But given the exhausted state of your opponent process cells, only part of them were able to be capable of firing action potentials. In this example, the green and yellow parts of the cells were ready to fire the light reflected off the white paper could excite only the yellow and green parts of the cells and so you saw a green and yellow shamrock. Let's try that one. Here in a negative after image the colors you see are inverted from the original image. So for example you stare a long time at a red image you'll see the green after image. The appearance of the negative after images can be explained by the opponent process. There. I think these two slides are flipped but it doesn't really matter. I talked talk you through the process already. So you can see an example of how this works by staring at the red shamrock in the next slide. I need to do this for about a minute. So pause it for a minute, stare at the red shamrock if you want to try this one, and then shift your gaze immediately to the white sheet of paper or the blank screen that I've provided. So here you go, red shamrock, one minute, go. Okay, did it work? Um, you should be able to see what looks like a green uh, Shamrock. So good luck to you. Here's the last one I have for you that's pretty fun, optical illusion. This is really cool. You can see how your visual system and the brain are actually able to briefly create a color image from a negative photo. So how do you perform this illusion? You stare at the dots located at the center of the woman's face. And there's one right here. There's three dots. Red, yellow, and green. You stare directly at the red, yellow, and green dot right below her left eye for about 30 seconds to a minute. Then you don't have to go to the next screen. You will immediately um, turn to the X on the right of the white image on the right. You'll blink a few quick times, a few several times, and what will you see? Well, let's go ahead and try it out and let's see what you see. Pause it, 30 seconds on her, look at the three dots, and then look at the X afterwards. Go. Okay, if you follow the directions correctly, you should see an image of the woman in full color. It's pretty neat, isn't it? So if you're having trouble seeing the effect, you may want to try staring at the negative image a bit longer or adjusting how far you're sitting from your computer monitor. You may need to get a little bit closer, in other words. So that's a pretty neat one. Um, one of the ones that I kind of enjoy the most. So how does this illusion work? I'm going to leave this up here for you to see. Um, and I'm going to stop the video at this point. But really interesting how we perceive color and the brain is really uh, doing some heavy lifting and some heavy work and major processing and that's why I think vision is such a major uh, thing for us and we've spent enough time in the brain developing it to make it that way so um, hopefully you have a much better idea of how vision works with sensation and perception um, until next time don't forget to be awesome